So the way we're going to proceed, we're going to talk about four of the seven conflict resolution films, and it fits perfectly into the seminar and trying to understand how do we make the enemy, the other, a friend and a guest. And what we thought we would do, we would present something, a few minutes <clears throat> to introduce the film, <clears throat> and then we would show a clip. And then for about 50 to 55 minutes or so, we'll have it, uh, that kind of format. And then we will begin uh, a dialogue, and Padraig will obviously offer some ideas of his own in his you know, great work in conflict resolution, resolution in the present. So war and conflict bring with them, as we know, and we've seen some of the images of the past, death, destruction, mutilation, rape, and above all, trauma. So both the perpetrators and the victims bear the same scars, some more radically than others, and some will never take, uh, a mo uh, will ever have that ability to be healed. And our attempt in these conflict resolution films is to show how the healing process can at least begin. And we've seen that there are great scars of guilt, humiliation, uh, and uh, above all, alienation from community. So what we've done in our conflict resolution film since 1997, when we first went to Northern Ireland, we've attempted to do quite an extensive uh, period of research and using especially Ray Helmick's you know, knowledge of each of these conflict areas. We would enter into the situation, get someone on the ground to assist us, film for usually two, three, four weeks if necessary, and then come back, write a script, working everything through, and present what I think is very important that I've learned from Ray myself, the dual narrative, two individuals in a conflict, each having their own valid histories at times, and bringing them to the fore and trying to reconcile in the best way possible. So we have tried to use that model through these seven conflict resolution films. And Ray will do the first one. We'll basically talk about uh, the Northern Ireland crisis. So Ray will say a few words about that, and we'll show a clip from uh, our first film, which is uh, Unexpected Openings. Ray? This uh, film about the Northern Ireland conflict, it's the second of two films we did on this. The one that you see listed there as the Out of the Ashes was done while the peace process was in its earlier stages. My own experience in the place was just asking Pari had he ever drawn this conclusion that the peace initiatives in Northern Ireland had come most directly from the militants, the people who had been most directly involved in the fighting are the ones who understood best how necessary it was to get out of that. I'd had that experience in talking with them from very early in the con conflict back in 1972. And eventually, the decisions about such things as the ceasefire, the opening of negotiations, had, had to be decided by the paramilitary leaderships, both IRA and UDA and UVF. And the thinking for it was done so largely in the prison. This is something I'd become very familiar with because over a period of years I had gone into the prison quite regularly to hold conversations with the prisoners in the H blocks. I'd had an experience earlier of being a mediator for about six weeks of the hunger strike in 1981. And I knew that from the prisoners we were going to get probably the best view of what was really at stake in the conflict and that they came to the conclusion that neither of their communities really had a future in Northern Ireland unless they learned how to accommodate each other. That sounds like a very low stage of reconciliation, but it was the essential thing that unless they could construct an Ireland, Ireland in which the other could live and be very much at home, there was not going to be a life for either side in that conflict. I had a mantra when I would hold these meetings in the H blocks that what was really needed from them was that they become the guarantors of one another's difference. Now, making the film, we weren't able to actually interview prisoners 
in the jail itself in Longkesh. They had a promise for that, and they told us the last minute that they had just had to turn down the BBC for that, so they were taken back. But we had a lot of prisoners that were out by the time we were making this film. It was in 99, was it? It was in 2000 that we did the interviewing. We saw a lot of the prisoners outside, and we were also given the opportunity to film in several of the H blocks that had that were out of use, but still full of all the murals. So, all right, you'll see it in the uh, bit of the film. As Northern Ireland makes its cautious steps toward a lasting peace, the early release of prisoners has become a subject of great anxiety. Some know these paramilitary prisoners as terrorists, while others call them heroic freedom fighters. Often classified as men of violence, they have dominated the 30 years of conflict, transforming people's hope-filled dreams into brutal nightmares. When I was six tenths, when I joined there, I, I was quite clear uh, about what was required to, to remove uh, Britain from Ireland and, and to achieve uh, national reunification. That would be done through, through armed force. People were being murdered, and I thought I had to do uh, much more than just protect my community, and that's when I joined the Ulster Defence Association. When I was 17 and a half years of age, then I went out and I murdered a Catholic simply because he was a Catholic and for no other reason. I also took part in two IRA operations which resulted in two murders. And as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old growing up in that area, I felt that something should be done to stop the IRA, something should be done to uh, finish these troubles to bring Northern Ireland back to normality. All of these former prisoners have a unique story to tell. They started down different roads to violence, yet each of them ended up with a common reality, imprisonment on terrorist charges. For some, this meant years when time was frozen, hope faded, and hatreds lingered. But for many of the men, something happened in prison that could ultimately help to pave the way towards peace in Northern Ireland. Those who took up arms to defend their political and religious beliefs came from opposite sides of the bloodied street. Men and women, Catholic and Protestant, Republican and Loyalist, all initially faced the conflict with idealism and determination. The backdrop of 1960s social activism had led Northern Ireland's Catholic minority to wage a civil rights campaign against the Protestant majority. Things turned drastically uncivil as extremists from both sides changed the war of words into one with real human casualties. It came about, first of all, by ratting in, in a particular area, where the two communities were uh, fighting each other. Um, it quickly became much more than that. Um, when bombs were being let off in the community in which I lived, people were being forced, to, forced out of their homes. Uh, I, I lived in the Shankill Road and in that area in the early 70s. There were quite a few no-warning car bombs, which resulted in a lot of uh, men, women and children being blown to pieces. And that's when I realised that uh, we wore it war. So after Northern Ireland, <clears throat> we had gone to the Balkans and we had gone with the Boston Theological uh, Institute with Rodney Peterson, and there we were able to be neutral. We came in a situation where we tried to meet the Croats, the Serbs, the Bosnians, 
anyone who would speak to us, but we were the outsiders. So we had an opportunity to meet everyone uh, on our own terms. We didn't seem to be a threat. We didn't have our agenda. What we wanted to hear was the personal history of each community in conflict. And when uh, the peace process had uh, been had come to a conclusion with the Dayton Peace Accords with uh, Bill Clinton in Ohio, uh, we decided that this would be a good time to start preparing for it. So we did meet individuals like the Patriarch, we met Serbs, uh, academics, we met politicians, and in that sense we were able to understand the conflict from their perspective, the historical perspective. But unfortunately as we were filming, the NATO bombing began uh, not during our time there, but when we had uh, started the film and we had, uh, uh, above all, had to put the whole project aside. So the crew had to go back a second time with a completely different um, objective in mind. So when we came back, we had a totally different film, as will happen also with the Mideast after the second intifada. So this film uh, starts out with the notion of creating a greater Serbia, and we start out with Kosovo, and we look to the conflict as it's presented in various forms. We had documented the violence, we had you know, personal trauma stories, but above all, we had the objectives of each community in how they uh, wanted to live their lives. But unfortunately, they were in conflict. So what we tried to do was to step back and see what is the conflict and how is it being resolved amongst the, uh, the three different uh, uh, institutions and groups that we had studied. So this one is uh, <clears throat> called Prelude to Kosovo, War and Peace in Bosnia and Croatia. It started and ended in Kosovo. These once peace-filled plains became a bloody battleground in 1389 as Turkish Muslims and Serbian Christians clashed. The Ottoman victory struck a mortal blow to the medieval Serbian kingdom, and a dream was born to restore Serbian prestige. How did the situation escalate to an international confrontation that displaced almost a million people and heaped 78 days of NATO bombs on the region? Twelve years prior to the Kosovo crisis, the former Yugoslavia was whipped into a nationalist frenzy appealing to the 600-year-old struggle nationalistic hysteria was built up from one town to another all across Bosnia and you could hear the calls for mobilizing the Serbian nation to revenge uh, what has happened to Serbs in Kosovo battle and to pronounce uh, Muslims as the arch enemy. Kosovo's story is but the tip of the iceberg that sadly reflects the anguish of the Balkans in the 1990s. The war had first passed through Croatia and Bosnia. Western nations felt bound to act quickly in Kosovo because they had stood back in indecision through the agony of these earlier ethnic catastrophes. What happened there was savage.
of the reasons that these people uh, behaved as they did. It was passed on generations and generations. And then you just, you know, when the whole nationalism has been evoked, then the, the ghosts of the past appeared. And then it is easy always to manipulate with the feelings and fears. Yeah, you remember how uh, Hamlet's father appeared on the wall uh, and said uh, that his soul cannot be pacified until Hamlet um, revenges him, his death. If thou discover thy dear father love, God, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder. It seems that um, uh, thousands of uh, fathers, ghosts um, appeared um, in one moment and all of them asked for revenge. Um, everyone had um, their reason for revenge. Um, How long did it take to destroy relations? Months, not longer, and bit by bit, in the hands of a limited number of people and the quietness of a majority, significant quietness, you can burn down a whole nation easily. So you get the idea. The violence of these things does get appalling. This third film is going to be about the Middle East and Israeli-Palestinian situation. Uh, we had to make two trips for this too, and John was speaking about whether you could take a neutral position or what. I know among my conversational and correspondence partners, as we're told, it was Yasser uh, Arafat, was uh, uh, Khaled Mashal, who runs the Hamas operation now. It's also been Yitzhak Shamir, Yitzhak Rabin, whole series of Israeli prime ministers and many other, both Palestinian and Israeli figures. We did this film in two sessions of shooting the film. We were over there during the summer of 2000, and we got a lot of very good interviews, both with Israelis and Palestinians, to see what the situation was like from both their points of view. And we came home thinking we had a film to be edited, of course, and then came Camp David and the uh, Second Intifada, and we realized we don't have a film until we go back again, which we did during the January of 2002, when the fighting was on very strongly, and uh, came back again with a lot of interviews from both sides. I had a very strong feeling myself that we were making this film for an American audience, which really wasn't going to be much interested in listening to Palestinians. And therefore, what we did was to make it a film about Israeli peacemakers. People, that's the subtitle of the film, Daring to Make Peace in the Middle East. There's a series of five portrait pieces that deal with uh, Israelis who have been very deeply involved in human rights situations and in peacemaking situations. And, all right, that's the way this film is put together. This is what the world sees of the conflict that has so long ravaged the haunted place that is Israel to some, Palestine to others, to everyone, the Holy Land. This is all we see, always expressed in terms of ruthless violence and abominable acts of terror. It's all that the world knows or maybe even cares to know. It's simpler that way.
Can we really find hope in this scene of disaster? Some extraordinary Israelis, undaunted by the tragedy around them, harken back to the traditional Jewish sense of tikkun olam, repairing the world. This land means different things to Jew and Arab. For Jews, the fulfillment of a dream, return to their ancient homeland. For Arabs, loss of their homeland. The disaster, the Nakba. The United Nations decided in 1947 to partition the territory into two states, one Jewish and one Arab. The Jews accepted this, the Arabs did not. War broke out when Israel declared its independence in 1948. Israelis, many refugees from the Holocaust, rejoiced. Many Palestinians, now finding themselves refugees, despaired. The armistice lines at war's end enlarged the Israeli territory. Renewed hostilities in 1967 left Israel in possession of the entire land, with the Palestinians who remained now under occupation. Seeing this territory as the area of the ancient Hebrew kingdoms, some Israeli settlers saw it as natural to move in. If these two peoples are to live in peace, the legacy of bitterness must be overcome. I grew up in the United States, in California, and I was active in a Zionist youth movement as a child, so I learned about Israel at an early age. I must have been about 20 years old when I came here and really had my eyes opened or, or opened my eyes to the reality of what, of what was going on here. I very much felt a sense of betrayal, that I had somehow been lied to or misled all those years when I was presented a very partial picture of the reality in Israel. I went back to the States and did my master's at Columbia University and then came to B'Tselem uh, six years ago. Meet Jessica Montel, executive director of a human rights organization that draws on Israel's biblical roots. It is called B'Tselem. B'Tselem is a Hebrew word that means in the image, and it comes from uh, the book of Genesis, where God created human beings in the image of God, uh, B'Tselem Elohim. And in uh, modern Hebrew, you use the word B'Tselem to refer to human dignity. It's a phrase that means human dignity, uh, the idea being that we are all created equally and all have equal rights. Okay, the last clip that we have, the fourth of the seven, uh, deals with Sicily. And most Americans get their image of the Mafia through either the Sopranos or the Godfather series. And when we went to Sicily, you know, Ray and I <clears throat> lined up the whole film. Our idea <clears throat> excuse me, was to see how the individuals would make peace amongst themselves, unite together, and fight the Mafia. And that was our intention. So uh, what we all wanted to do was basically show a united Sicily and this was very very difficult to do because it was still under the cloak a bit of the mafia when we were there uh, in uh, 2003 and we gradually saw this you know through the eyes of many individuals that we had worked with first of all we saw the divisions um, very, very overtly in many ways prior to this. And then finally, the turning point came, as you're gonna see in this film, with 
the Sicilians saying, basta, enough. And the hard work really was the strong women who put up sheets to defy the mafia and out the mafia bosses, a reluctant church that finally got involved, and a crusading mayor, Leolanda Orluca, who was extremely uh, volatile in many ways in fighting the mafia. And he became number three on the hit list, and you'll see the first two who are killed at the beginning of the film. And it was individuals like this that defied the mafia, that outed them, brought them to their knees, put them in jail, and literally broke the back of La Cosa Nostra. And when we had filmed, we had really understood you know, a lot of the very, very powerful, uh, the powerful grip that the mafia had on the people. So we entitled the film, Killing Silence, Taking on the Mafia in Sicily. And the whole idea of the silence, the omerta, was something that was well known throughout the entire system. And how to break it? These individuals that I just named were the ones who took that on. And when my wife and I were going through some of the translations, we saw how difficult it was uh, for people sometimes at first to come forth and to name names or try to uh, bring to justice the mafia. Uh, but it was only these individuals that I mentioned who really worked hard at this for years before uh, the mafia began to crumble. And we'll talk about this later on, how maybe it might, like the phoenix, unfortunately, rise again in different forms. But in the beginning of the film, you'll see the background to this omerta, the silence. The very idea of silence seems an impossibility here. But this is Sicily, a land of baffling paradox. A sunny Mediterranean enclave studded with vast and gorgeous vistas. It has for three millennia defied those who would tame her. Invaders come, invaders go, each leaving traces but never quenching the Sicilian spirit. But from within, Sicily has always been oddly and agonizingly vulnerable. It is a place that has long suffered in silence from something called La Cosa Nostra, better known to the rest of the world as the Mafia. capital of Sicily, is haunted by images of a nation's recent tortured past. The airport is named for Sicily's foremost modern martyrs, two brave men of the law who spearheaded a national revolt against a national menace and paid with their lives. It was off the Capaci exit on the highway leaving the airport that the entourage of Judge Giovanni Falcone was dynamited in May of 1992. Two months later, his colleague, prosecutor Paolo Borsellino, was blown up as he arrived at his mother's home. 
They were but two of the estimated 10,000 Sicilians killed by the Mafia between 1983 and 1992. But the Falcone Borsellino murders were so horrific, so brazen, so contemptuous of the most rudimentary notions of civility that have been in place here for 3,000 years, they triggered something deep within these people. Basta, they clamored, seemingly as one. Enough. The Sicilians then mounted an impressive effort to reclaim their voice, their streets, their history. But can they succeed? They have drawn such a line before with as much sincerity and purpose. And always, the Mafia has come back. Io forse ho incontrato veramente la mafia quando hanno ucciso Giovanni Falcone. I probably really first encountered the mafia when they murdered Giovanni Falcone. I was in Turin chairing a meeting on group psychotherapy when the news of Giovanni's assassination came over the television and somebody, realizing he had been my friend, stopped the meeting. Girolamo Laverso has seen denial up close in his work as a psychotherapist. But a whole country in denial? Later, during my research, I began to realize how frequently I had encountered the Mafia without being aware of it. Because for years, the Mafia had the ability to make itself invisible. And even if everyone saw it, they would say, there is no Mafia. Leo Luca Orlando, former mayor of Palermo and feisty, outspoken opponent of the Mafia, understands the hold that the Mafia has had on the people. When I was 14, 15 years old, I organized just a meeting about the Mafia, against the Mafia, with other scholars of, the, of, of this institute and the director of the institute, the Jesuit, directing uh, the institute, called my parents and said, it's a scandal. Why Luca does speak about the Mafia? We have nothing to do with the Mafia, therefore we are not to speak about the Mafia. Not speaking about something as vital as the air they breathed, as omnipresent as the azure seas surrounding them, as normal as a day drenched in sun, that is what the Mafia has always been to the people of Sicily. So those four clips give you an idea of how these conflicts come about over a long period of time and how people try to resolve the conflicts. How do they live together? How do you make the enemy your friend and your guest? And it is a major struggle. And in our films, we have seen the example of Germany and France uh, how it had taken years and years and generations almost before they even began to talk to each other after three wars. And we had seen that if it were possible with the Germans and uh, the French finally to come some, up to, uh, some understanding, it could be possible to work on different reconciliation processes. So these are the four. The other films that we have in the series would be on South Africa and apartheid. And one of the individuals that we interviewed says basically why there was no black revolution after Mandela had come to power. We are a forgiving people. When we looked at Out of the Ashes, we heard many, many different voices from all different sectors, religious and political especially. And they said that in these 30 years, 3,500 people had been killed, but it could have really been worse and we have tried to bring together uh, these various voices who could reconcile the differences of Catholic and Protestant. And then most recently, we had filmed in Russia as the younger generation tries to confront the older generation and basically say, look, we want to understand our past, dark as it is, and you won't let us. So it's an, a big abuse, a serious abuse of human rights that the younger generation wants to confront. So those are our seven films thus far, and what we're trying to understand there 
is how we can reconcile or understand the other as the first step. So, you know, that's basically our presentation that Ray and I have been uh, working on over the past uh, 12 years now. And thank you, John. And Father Raymond, they are really uh, some extraordinary footage in those, uh, in those uh, films, and every time that I was really waiting to get into it, the clip stopped. So I think I should just sit down and let you show the whole thing, uh, the whole thing and we would all gain much more. Um, you know, a couple of words struck me, um, and it was what uh, Father Ray kind of whispered to me in the, uh, on, the, on, 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 on the way in, and it was that the prisoners, uh, the militants, are the, um, the people who begin uh, peace processes. And um, as a result of the uh, Helsinki talks, uh, the BBC did a, um, a documentary that was shown a couple of weeks ago. I didn't see it, but it was shown in, in, in Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK in, in, in the course of which I said uh, that uh, killers make the best negotiators. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerry Adams took great exception to it. I was kind of got the message relayed. Now, I did not say that IRA killers make the best negotiators. I simply said that killers make the best negotiators. And in fact, it's something that I, I, I do believe in to a, a, a considerable degree. And uh, my model, if I want to call it that, for use of a better term, uh, that now, will I'll tell you in a minute, but it is, is that it came from my, my like almost 20 years of observing how people behaved in, in, in Northern Ireland and then going to South Africa and getting involved in documentation of the uh, entire peace process in South Africa from before apartheid ended right through to the year 2001, the end of uh, Thabo Mbeki's first term. And um, what I observed among the South Africans was that uh, the Northern Irish behaved very much in, in, in a way that the South Africans did. Uh, and the notion began to dawn on me that uh, people from divided societies uh, share a lot of characteristics in common, uh, psychological characteristics. Uh, that are not characteristics that you and I have, that they see certain things in different ways through different prisms. And if I were to quickly say what some of them are, is that for example, all of them, all of them think that their conflicts are unique. Nobody has ever seen a conflict like ours. Everyone says that. And everyone says, before all this started, we used to live in peace. You know, denial, you know. Frozen conflict was there just waiting to be de-iced, so to speak. And when it did, everything breaks loose, whether it's in Northern Ireland or in the, uh, in the, in, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, yeah, no one but ourselves can ever understand our, 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 our conflict. Um, you have, in, in all of them, you had uh, majority-minority dichotomies, whether it was uh, involving race, uh, ethnic color, ethnic, ethnicity, or religion, where one group was in a subordinate position to the other group, and one group had accumulated grievances over time against the other, that in the end, for lack of other outlets, express themselves in violence. And um, what I would call the, uh, the narcissism of small differences. Uh, and my, maybe my, the, my favorite example of this is in, is in Northern Ireland, where the loyalists that you heard and the members of the IRA that you heard 
came from the poorest communities in Northern Ireland. I mean, the Shankill Road, identified with Protestant militism, and the Falls Road, identified with uh, Republican militism, are both parallel to each other. And yet, for, for decades, perhaps forever, uh, one group had never crossed over into the other. But the people in the, in the Shankill Road who didn't realize that they, that they were as poor off as the, the, the poorest Catholic still regarded themselves as being superior because they belonged to the superior group. And that marginal little difference was what gave them a feeling of immense superiority over the Catholic community and precluded them in some way from bonding together in class warfare against whom would have been the real enemy, the Protestant ascendancy. And I could go through a number of other characteristics, but it, it, it was through this that led me in 1996 um, to, or 1997 to arrange for all the uh, chief negotiators in Northern Ireland uh, to come to South Africa um, to meet over a period of four days uh, with all the chief negotiators from all the parties in South Africa, uh, including the apartheid government and uh, those of Chief Gatha Butelezi, who was regarded as a sellout collaborator by the, uh, by the ANC. And what they had to do was begin by listening to the narratives of how the South Africans came out of their conflict. How, in fact, going back to the prison analogy, one man in a prison in 1985 broke ranks with the rest of his comrades in the ANC, and that was Nelson Mandela. He was, he was off Robben Island, and he was in a prison called Palsmore Prison outside of Cape Town. And he was on f one floor on his own. And his four closest compatriots were on another floor on, uh, together. And uh, Mandela came to the conclusion that violence would not work, that violence would, re would result in a South Africa that was totally destroyed and that nobody would be the winner. But he tells in his autobiography of how rather than consulting his colleagues, and the ANC is an organization where everything is done through a consultative process, everything is done by consensus, that rather than consulting them, because he knew they would say no, this is a decision for the National Executive Committee, you can't take this decision on your own. He decided unilaterally that he would make an opening to the um, apartheid government. And this he did alone, and in this he broke, he broke ranks. But it was from sitting in a prison that he understood. After his years on Robben Island, and now his years in this halfway prison, that he understood violence was never going to work. In the same way, about two years later, now his, his first overtures to the government didn't meet with any response at all, not until about 1998, when the uh, head of the uh, National Security Agency in South Africa arrived at a similar conclusion, that the apartheid government could never prevail. And uh, it was he who instigated conversations uh, with, with uh, Mandela that uh, nobody knew of over a period of about a year. About, I think they had uh, 48 conversations, uh, four people from the apartheid government side versus Mandela. And this man, was, his name was Neil Barnard, an, an absolutely determined uh, Afrikaner nationalist. And the first thing he would tell you when you met him was that he was an Afrikaner nationalist. And I recall having to tell him uh, the, the peculiar role that the Irish played in Afrikaner history, because in the uh, 
in the first uh, Anglo-Boer War, we sent out um, uh, Irish kind of Republicans sent out a regiment to fight alongside the Boers against the British. And that regiment was headed by uh, a man named, um, just left my head now, a man Boer. named, come on, uh, uh, John McBride. Yeah, yeah, John McBride, okay. And uh, McBride uh, headed this brigade and fought uh, for the, um, uh, with the Afrikaners against the British, uh, not recognizing that the Afrikaners were absolute racists. I mean, because everybody then regarded black people as just being inferior, and they didn't count in any equation or any war or, or, or any anything, uh, which was to be the case in South Africa until 1991. But what I had to tell him was that it was uh, John McBride's uh, son who uh, was appointed by the UN to oversee the um, integration or, 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 or the decolonization of Namibia uh, by the South Africans. And like it, that was the first step towards the end of uh, of, uh, of apartheid. So he had a, a grandfather and a son came in at different ends of this equation, both on different sides. Um, but when the, 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 when they came to South Africa, the, the, the Sinn Féin, who had its delegation, was headed by Martin McGuinness, now the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. <coughs> and uh, the uh, Unionist delegation, or the hardline Unionist delegation, was headed by Peter Robinson, now the First Minister of Northern Ireland. But one of the rules before the Democratic Unionist Party, that's the party of um, Peter Robinson would take place, uh, or was that they could never see or be in the same room as members of Sinn Féin. So even when President Mandela came down to talk to them for a day, uh, the Unionists would not get into the same room as Sinn Féin. And I had to tell President Mandela, would he tolerate a little bit of apartheid? And he laughed. So rather than giving one address, he gave two addresses. And it was one of those opportunistic moments that happen in processes of negotiations and, and ultimately reconciliation. He took the opportunity to give two different messages to Sinn Féin and the IRA, if you want to call them that. He said that unless the IRA declared a ceasefire, it would never get into negotiations. And Sinn Féin revered Mandela. I mean, in the middle of the Falls Road, there's a, a monument to him. So they were kind of taken aback by his kind of hard-line attitude that had to be a ceasefire. But when he saw the Unionists, he said, you have two demands you're making uh, of, of Sinn Féin. You want them to de uh, declare a ceasefire, and then you want them to decommission their arms get rid of all the arms before you let them into negotiations. What I want you to do is to decouple the two. What you should do, he didn't say what I want you to do, you should consider decoupling the two. If they agree to a ceasefire, bring them into negotiations, and then deal with the problem of the decommissioning of arms in the negotiating process itself. Well, decommissioning was part of the Good Friday Agreement. It took 10 years for that to take place. And the real government of Northern Ireland as it stands today did not come into effect until March of 2007. Now the important thing here is that you had, uh, in, in South Africa, two different groups reaching the conclusion that violence wouldn't work, but they each reached it at a different point in time, which meant the ANC had to con continue with its war. Uh, in Northern Ireland, Adams and McGuinness had been moving for some time in the direction 
of looking for a way out of their predicament. And their predicament was that the IRA is an organization that exists for over 100 years uh, and that had a very simple philosophy that to get the British out of Ireland and you reunify Ireland, uh, only physical force would work, politics could not work. And what opened the door to politics was the hunger strike of Bobby Sands in 1981. But what they had to do, those small group that began, is first of all, they had to convince the leadership in the IRA that there should be a ceasefire, step one. Now there's a peace settlement, the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, which calls for the IRA to get rid of all its arms. In effect, it's asking the IRA to put itself out of business. Now in any period in that 100 years before, uh, the IRA had split about uh, at least six or seven times. One group would always come into politics, one group would stay out, then the out group would split, one arm would come into politics, one group would stay out, and then it would re-split, and it replicated itself every 10, 15, or 20 years. So they had to bring their constituency, the Republican constituency in the Catholic community, with them before they could tackle the problem of the leadership in the IRA. And that took 10 years to get the two synchronized. With Protestant paramilitaries, that's never happened. And they are not part of, they have not decommissioned their arms. Because once there was peace, they didn't have an ideology. Uh, they kind of have gotten lost. And I have a friend who, who has been working with them now for years to try to convince them that the time has come to decommission their arms. But most of all, what you have now in the lower working classes in the Protestant neighborhoods is fear. They fear that the Catholics have won out because now they look at the, the, the poor Catholic community and the poor Catholic community having achieved parity in their eyes has achieved victory. So the danger spots in the Northern Irish peace process lie in the, in the Protestant community. And there were a group of people who, after the two soldiers were killed in Northern Ireland a couple of weeks ago, who worked day and night with the Protestant paramilitary groups, particularly the UDA, whom you saw in this process, that they not retaliate because their immediate motivation was to kill a Catholic. Because you can't, why they would kill Catholics was because while the IRA said we are honorable, we only kill people who wear the uniform of the crown, that's somebody who's identifiable. Uh, Republicans are not identifiable, so their way out was to kill any Catholic was a Republican. After Good Friday, the Northern Irish gave great uh, praise and, uh, to the South Africans for the role they had played in their peace process. So when 10 years later, an opportunity arose to bring Shia and Sunni parties, who this is at the height of sectarian violence in Baghdad in 2006, early 2007, um, an opportunity arose to ask these parties whether they would be willing to meet with the chief negotiators from Northern Ireland and South Africa. And in the end, they did, in Helsinki. And there were 16 of them, just from Shia and Sunni parties the first time. And again, they were asked to listen to the narratives of the South Africans and the Northern Irish, how they came out of conflict into a transition process and then to set an agenda. And when the Northern Irish and South Africans, particularly the Northern Irish, were telling their stories, you could see Iraqi heads begin to nod. They were identifying. And I often use the analogy of, 
of conflict and addiction. That, that in the same way as the best treatment for addicts is in programs such as Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, where recovery is based on people sharing their experiences with each other and recognizing they are not alone and where the group has more power than the individual. This model kind of posits something similar. And with the Iraqis, it worked. They had no idea why they were there. They had no agenda. But after they listened to the Northern Irish and South Africans, they bonded with them. And that bond allowed them to start working with each other. And out of that, they produced a document to their own utter amazement after four days. And they signed it like children. But the important decision they made was they said, our leaders must come and work with you people from Northern Ireland and South Africa. And 36 did come to Helsinki in uh, April, just a year ago, April 23rd last year. And after four days working with the Northern Irish and South Africans, they produced this document finally signed in Baghdad in, um, on the 5th of July 2008 that laid out seven team principles that would provide the framework within which they would settle all future disputes and 16 mechanisms that they would use to monitor compliance with the principles. Now next week, as the next step in this process, we are bringing, if it is true that divided societies can help other divided societies, then perhaps it should also be true that cities that have been at the epicenter of those conflicts can help other cities that have been at the epicenter of their own conflicts. So next week at uh, UMass Boston, we're going to try out this idea. We're bringing um, seven people from Kirkuk. Uh, Kirkuk is, the, is where the future of Iraq will be decided. The Kurds in Kirkuk want to belong to Kurdistan. The Arabs and Turkmen in Kirkuk want to belong to Arab Iraq. So two different national aspirations. And what internal governance? You have Turkmen, Arabs, Assyrians, Christians, and Kurds. How do they govern themselves internally? How do they share power? That's one group. The second group is from Nicosia. From Nicosia in the Republic of Cyprus, uh, that's Greek Cypriot, uh, led by uh, its mayor. And uh, the mayor and city officials from the uh, Northern Republic, sorry, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which is recognized only by Turkey and which I got strict instructions from the, from the Cypriot ambassador cannot be used at all. It can't even be referred to because it doesn't exist. Uh, if it is referred to as the, as the Republic in Cyprus, then everybody else from his side will go home. So I disinvited the ambassador and took care of that problem. Uh, I mean, I literally disinvited him and said, you're trouble, bye-bye. Third city is uh, Mitrovica. Uh, in, in Kosovo and in Serbia. Now, when the Atasari plan was put into action, um, it provided that, that Mitrovica would be in Kosovo. Uh, but the, uh, the Serbs in Mitrovica, which contains 28% of the uh, total Serbian population left in all of Kosovo um, said no. And there's a river, the River Ibar. And on the northern side of the River Ibar, the people say they belong to Serbia. And on the southern side, they say they belong to Kosovo. So in the same municipality, you now have two municipalities 
two sets of city councils, two sets of mayors, and of course the people from Kosovo don't recognize the people from Serbia since they say they're an illegal institution. But they're not quite, because even though the, the US and the West recognized uh, Kosovo as an independent state, the UN did not, uh, with Russia exercising its, its, uh, its uh, veto. And finally, we have the mayor of, of, of Derry and the deputy mayor. Uh, the mayor of Derry is a, a, a moderate nationalist. Uh, the deputy mayor is a, a hardline member of uh, Peter Robinson's party. And uh, they're bringing a delegation, including Sinn Féin, uh, too. And um, in the tragedy of, 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 of Derry, stroke Londonderry. Uh, it was always called Londonderry since 1640 or so, 1603, I think, when it got a royal charter with the first settlers who came. So even though Catholics were, a it was the only city in Northern Ireland where Catholics were a majority, um, but because of gerrymandering and the fact that uh, if you had a business for every 10,000 pounds extra valuation of your business, you got an extra vote. Uh, it meant that a, a Protestant with a, a business of, uh, with a valuation of 500,000 um, pounds got uh, 5,000 votes. And they put all the Catholics in one word, ward and divided up all the Protestants into other wards so that Protestants, even though they were a minority in the city, uh, controlled the city council until the 1970s. And as soon as Catholics did the gerrymandering was gotten rid of and all of that stuff went, Catholics became a majority on the city council and immediately named it the Derry City Council and all hell broke loose in the Protestant community. So it's called to this day London Derry Stroke Derry or as the natives refer to it, Stroke City. <laughs> so they're coming now, what all of, of these cities have in common is that every group or nationality in them live in separate enclaves. Uh, whether you call it a voluntary ethnic cleansing or, 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 or violent ethnic cleansing or, as it happens most time, cleansing by fear. Uh, there are very, very few um, mixed areas of a Protestant population in, in, in Derry the Catholics lived on what is called city side of the River Foyle Protestants on the on the uh, water side there were 19,000 Protestants living on the city side where Catholics are in a huge majority in 1969 uh, today there are 500 they've either moved out altogether or they've moved to the other side of the river. Rivers are important. They're a natural means of division. Now, the hope is that if they bring all these cities together, not the hope, they're coming as of today, 35 people, that after three days, again, I'm going to require them <coughs> They all say, where's the agenda? Where's the agenda? And I don't want to tell them there is no agenda. You're going to make it up as you go along. Best kind of agenda. And what you will do first is you will listen to each other and you'll hear the different perspectives from each city regarding its own history and its own past and how it came out of violence into a transitional period. And then you will break up and talk to each other in small groups with every city represented in each group and you will draw what you think should be on an agenda come back, put it on the table, we'll have a plenary session and that will draw up the agenda. At the end of the third day a proposition will be put to them and that is do they have enough in common looking at their differences, are their differences the same in many, many ways? That they would see 
great benefit in establishing a permanent club for divided cities. And they would be the founding members. And each year, each city would host all of the other cities and take 10 or 12 people who would go first year, let's say Derry, would host the other three cities for about two weeks. And they would see from the ground up how things work, how services are provided. They'd go into the different communities, still hear about the bitternesses that remain. Because, you know, the end of, 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 of violence is not peace. It's just the very, very beginning. And again, the analogy I like to use is that these societies or these cities are all in recovery like addicts. That's the best they will ever get to be. But if they nurture that recovery all the time, if they never forget where they've been, if they never forget that they'll actually get well, be cured of whatever malaise has built up in them over centuries, oh, like almost hatreds that have become genetically transmitted from one generation to the next, if they never forget that, then they'll be okay. But if they do forget it, they say, we're fine, you know, last year we attracted 100 million in foreign investment, look at these hotels going up, look at this, look at that, we're all ready for the tourists, then they'll forget where they came from. And they can never forget where they came from. And they can reinforce each other. And for cities like Kirkuk or Mitrovica, which are at the bottom end of the scale, who are not used yet to hard negotiations, uh, who are still uh, very fearful of each other, you're creating space for them. And you're creating space for them to get rid of that fear. Because what you heard in the last movie was fear. People kept silent because of fear. In the same way as in Northern Ireland, Catholics for many years kept silent when they could have taken any number of matters into their own hands, not violently, non-violently. It wasn't until the 1960s, 40 years after the first injustice on them, that they began to articulate their own fears. So that's the hope. But in the end, in all of this stuff, make it very clear to the people who come that it's entirely in their hands, that we who bring them together only do so to serve them. We will have these, when these people arrive on Monday evening and say, where's the agenda, where's the agenda, where's the agenda? I'll say, oh, no agenda. And they'll probably get all riled up, why is there no agenda? They've never been to a conference, there's never been an agenda. And I tell them, every decision they make, from the time they'll have breakfast in the morning to when they'll break for lunch, to when they break for supper, and what they do in between is entirely in their hands. They will decide what they want to do. At the end of the day, we'll have a process to review what has gone on during the day, and if they want to change things around the following day, hey, evolve, change. Make it up as you go along, as long as you never lose sight of the goal. And the goal is to create something together that will enhance the possibility or the probability of you all gaining a little bit in reconciliation. Because by reconciling with the outsider, I, I told the guy from Northern, finish with this, the guy from Northern Mitrovica, that's in, in, in Serbia, said he was not coming. He would never talk to the people on the other side of the river. I said, you don't have to. You don't have to. You can talk to people from Cyprus, you can talk to people from Kirkuk, from Northern Ireland, you can talk to all the other people, and you need never even bother saying a word to the people from the other side of the river. And he said, in that case, I'll come. <laughs> you know? But by doing that, he'll be indirectly talking to them. So thank you, and thanks for the, uh, the really beautiful, gracious, and wonderful movies. Okay.